Thank you very much. All right, so I'm excited to be here. Uh, and I got to tell you, though, I was standing, uh, standing back listening to Ethan, thinking I should maybe take chat, chat GPT and ask it, how would Amanda Cox make my slides look much better? <laughs> but I've, I realized I ran out of time, so we're kind of stuck with what we have here. Anyway, I'm really excited to talk to you about something that I think is one of the most important things facing organizations today, which is how to help employees with mental health. And this is certainly something that's growing in importance or awareness, and organizations are trying to figure out what to do with it. And I can't tell you all of that, because that's obviously very complicated. I'm not a healthcare professional, so I can't give you information on how to diagnose or treat this. And I'm certainly not a legal expert, so I can't give you uh, advice on compliance. What I am is a behavioral and social scientist, and I'm somebody who's worked with large-scale data sets that match employers, employees, uh, and mental health data, uh, specifically with medical and prescription drug data. And what I also am is a patient. So 22 years ago, when I was first diagnosed with cancer, uh, I was in perfect mental health. Like, I was happy, I was calm. And then within the course of a year, year and a half, I developed post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and depression. And so I've lived through this. I've lived with this for 22 years. Uh, but what I've also done is I've been able to thrive with it. And so much about that is what I want to talk about today, which is this idea of how do we create cultures of awareness? How do we create cultures where people are able to understand what they're suffering from, uh, able to get access and able to get acceptance in organizations? So in uh, 2021, I spent a lot of time with Chris Ryder, who's a good friend of mine and a professor at, at uh, University of Michigan, uh, talking about this question exactly, which is why do we observe more mental health diagnoses, disorders, uh, in some organizations than others. And a lot of this was motivated by a piece of research we'd read, which had basically categorized organizations that seemed to have more people being diagnosed with mental health disorders as being unhealthy. And this really struck us as quite wrong, because there are lots of different reasons why some organizations uh, might have different uh, levels of observable mental health than others. Uh, an obvious one has to do with just simply the nature of work. So Julia DiPinino, who's a qualitative researcher and professor uh, at Yale School of Management, has done a lot of really careful qualitative work uh, with the US Army. Uh, and one of the things that she went in and did was look at sort of how in the US Army you have this very intense, often traumatic, and very stressful job missions. And so you had on one hand, you had sort of the mission commanders who were basically needed people to engage in these things. And on the other hand, you had healthcare professionals who were trying to essentially treat that at the same time. So some, you know, some job tasks are just inherently going to be more stressful and sometimes traumatic. And in fact, it's not just the military. If you look at healthcare, and, and Lord knows I've spent a lot of time in hospitals and seen this firsthand, uh, healthcare providers, and particularly during the COVID crisis, uh, have been dealing with a lot of trauma, a lot of loss, and a lot of intense stress. Uh, there was this great study that was done in a, a top medical journal uh, that looked at 520 survey respondents. And these were first responders, and they were also medical professionals. And what they found was, in the self-reported data, was they found that 38% of these uh, professionals basically reported having uh, clinically significant uh, symptoms of PTSD. Uh, three quarters of them had clinically uh, significant symptoms of depression, anxiety, and 15% of them had serious thoughts of suicide and self-harm. And we can't tell people not to take these jobs. I mean, these are heroic jobs. Many of the people who do these things go into it knowing exactly what that cost will be. The question is about how do we, understanding these types of jobs, try to make them a little bit better, but more importantly, how do we provide support for folks like that? And it's not just about the nature of work. It's also about the nature of the organizations that we're in. It's about the policies that we set. Uh, but one of my favorite studies is this early study from Denmark. That's a photo of Denmark. Um, they're very colorful, uh, which is a study that basically linked employers and employees uh, with prescription drug data. And, and what this study happened would, or found, which Michael Dahl, who's a professor at the Auburn University, uh, did it, was basically that when organizations are going through multidimensional change, uh, and this should not be surprising, but when they're going through multidimensional change, you see dramatic increases in the use of SSRIs and benzodiazepine medication, which again, isn't a bad thing. Like, if people are sick, we want them to get treatment but it does indicate that these are likely going to be times when that sort of treatment is going to be really important. But what Chris and I came to realize was something different. We came to realize that the question really isn't about 
why do some organizations have more mental health disorders? It's really about why do we observe more mental disorders in some organizations? And these are two different questions. And the reason these are two different questions is that we don't actually observe true mental health levels in organizations. And one of the reasons for this, of course, is that people don't freely share their medical da uh, data or their medical diagnoses, which is perfectly fine. They have every right not to do that. But the question is, do some organizations systematically uh, have less of this apparent and others have more of a parent, and why is that the case? Uh, well, so in order to look at this, I got really excited about this talk, so I went and gathered some primary data. Uh, I partnered with a company called Civic Science, which pulls about four, uh, about four million people a day on the internet. And so they helped me build a representative sample, and we gathered about 20,000 poll responses. And the first thing that I asked these folks uh, was I asked them about stigma. So I asked them whether or not they agree or disagree that society judges those who are getting help for uh, mental health issues. Uh, and two-thirds of them basically said yes. They agreed with this. You know, and, and this looks really bad, right? It looks bad that uh, such a widespread condition uh, has so much stigma. But I will tell you this is way better than it would have been 10 years ago and way better than it would have been 20 years ago. And I'm hoping this number will keep falling. And I think there's a lot of hope for why that'll be. And I'll talk about that here shortly. Um, what I also asked, of course, is just like how widespread is this? And in fact, if you ask people whether or not they're suffering from anxiety or depression and whether or not they're being treated, you see that you know, nearly 40% of people respond that they're suffering from it. You know, and a smaller amount have been formally diagnosed, and a smaller amount, even than that, 14% have actually been treated. So this is a widespread problem. It's something that a lot of people are dealing with, and yet it's still something that society is stigmatizing. And so how do we break this down to make sure that sick people are able to get help? The reason, of course, and we see this evidence from uh, you know, people's view of how society views it, is that people are really don't feel safe sharing this with their employer. And I'm not talking about people necessarily going to their boss and saying, hey, guess what? I've been diagnosed with PTSD. But people have to hide oftentimes that they're actually going for a medical appointment that's a mental, mental health one. It makes it harder. It makes it less likely for them to do it because they don't have to explain it. And so you can see here that the majority of people aren't at all uh, comfortable with this. And a small proportion of them would feel like they could just openly discuss it uh, with those in their organization. And part of the problem is when people are uncomfortable with this, uh, they don't know others who are also suffering from these issues or in treatment. And because, you know, think about how many coworkers you have. If it's really this prevalent of an issue, you should know quite a number of people who are in treatment for this. Uh, but yet if you ask people this, you know, the vast majority basically say they don't know anyone in their organization. Now again, I think these numbers look way better than they would have 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, but still, there's a lot of work to do because certainly a lot more people are actually getting treatment uh, than people know about. And when you don't know others who are getting treatment, when you don't know others who have found solutions to these problems, uh, you don't necessarily know that you have a problem. And what you really don't know is actually if you're able to get help, that that help is likely to, to help you thrive better. So you know, one of the other things we did is we broke this down based on how comfortable people were. were. And what you see when you break this down based on their answers on how comfortable they were uh, is you learn that really when people are very comfortable, as these top bars show, um, they're far more likely to, to uh, know other people who are in their um, organization. And they're far more comfortable for their employer uh, to know about this. And so really what we see is we see sort of these patterns where you have these clusters of organizations where there are organizations where people, people feel comfortable with their uh, with their managers knowing about this. And second of all, they know lots of other people because of this who also form a community within their organization. And what does this do? So when there's a culture of safety, and when there's a culture of awareness, uh, it allows people to get treatment. And so again, if you look at the people in the top bar, these are the ones who are comfortable with their company knowing they're far, far more likely uh, to be diagnosed, and they're far, far more likely to get treatment. And again, this doesn't mean that one causes another. What it means is these things cluster together in organizations. There are differences across organizations in awareness, safety, and then ultimately treatment. And you know, we heard Liz talk about this this morning with the self-response data. But you know, there's a big payoff even beyond sort of the normative ones. So the main reason we would want employees uh, to be aware and get help for mental health is because this is what we should be worrying about. We want our employees to be healthier. We want them to live better lives. But there's also a payoff in terms of productivity. 
Uh, so I did a study with Ian Larkin and Tim Gubler, a couple of my colleagues, and what we looked at specifically is what happens when you actually give people access to diagnosis and then give them the opportunity to be treated. What we found very specifically is that when there are improvements in nutrition, exercise, cholesterol, stress, other health factors, people actually do become more productive. Now, what's interesting about this study was that the laundry company that we worked with, an industrial laundry company, when they brought in an independent company to offer voluntary screenings to their employees, uh, a few remarkable things happened. One, nearly all of their employees took that opportunity and met with the healthcare professionals, took the tests. Number two, uh, they got the diagnoses, and many of them didn't know how sick they were. So for example, a third of the workers in this uh, company had diabetes or prediabetes and didn't even know it. Uh, they were given recommendations and given referrals to doctors. Uh, we tested them again a year later, and they'd improved dramatically. Uh, many, many of them had much better health. And perhaps most importantly uh, to this point, uh, the ones whose health improved had these type of productivity gains. And what's so great about this is that everybody's benefiting here. The people are getting healthier, the company is getting more productivity, and in an organization like this that has performance-based pay, the people are also getting higher wages. And so really this is a case of if you just give people the resources, the awareness, and the safety, uh, you can get mutual gains for this. There are benefits to the performance of the organization uh, if you provide opportunities for people. And it's not just that. There are other big payoffs, and a huge payoff for uh, organizations moving forward is this idea of having an open and supportive culture will actually help attract and retain talent. And of course, this is one of the most expensive things that firms go through with people, is trying to retain and attract uh, talent, particularly in a labor market like this. Uh, so going back to Denmark again with the Red Houses, um, you know, a study that Michael and I did looked at this, and, and what we found consistently along with other studies is that when firms basically adopt policies that tend to raise mental health uh, risks, the people intentionally select in and out of those organizations based on understanding how that's gonna affect their health. And so if you provide an environment that's gonna be supportive, be non-stigmatizing, that's gonna give them the opportunity to get better, you're gonna be much more able to attract and retain talent. And this is growing increasingly important uh, because we have new generations coming into the workforce. Uh, if you break down a lot of these questions by age group, what you'll see is the younger people who are here at the top, uh, they have very, very different levels of awareness and very, very different levels of comfort and culture with regard to mental health. Far, far more of them um, know colleagues and leaders uh, in their organizations uh, that have been diagnosed uh, and are in treatment. And the particularly striking one here is the leaders. Uh, and I'll tell you about why that is here, but leaders set such important examples on what's safe and what's not safe in an organization. You know, when you look at older generations, and I won't say which one I'm in, although it's probably not hard to guess. Um, when you look at people over 55, I'm not in that one, um, what you see is 75% of people don't know anybody. They don't know anybody who is in treatment for this. And we know simply from the base rates uh, that they actually know lots of people who are in treatment for this. Uh, they just don't know that they're in treatment. And so this is changing, and the new workforce, the workforce of the future, is gonna be one that's gonna expect a culture of awareness. Um, if you ask them directly about whether or not they'd be comfortable with their employer knowing, they also show a much greater level of awareness and culture, which is these new generations of workers are going to be expecting workplaces where their employers are supportive of their mental health and where they don't have to feel like they can hide this. Uh, and that, of course, is the main key to what we really care about, right, which is getting people help. Uh, we want people to be aware of this, we want them to feel safe to get the resources they need, and we want them to get treated to get healthier. One of my favorite quotes from Julia's work uh, is this one, and I think this real, really iterates, reiterates what we as leaders can do uh, to help with the culture of our organizations. One of the reasons that I'm so public about my mental health challenges is because I'm in a position of privilege to do this. I don't fall into sort of any types of stereotypes. Um, I'm in a position of success. I have job stability. Uh, people don't tend to blame me for mental health issues given my health history. And so I feel like I have that privilege and that responsibility to let people know that it's possible to have great lives, successful careers, uh, even when you're suffering from these things over time. And that it's possible to get treatments that are in fact 
really successful in helping. And so I'm never going to tell anybody what they should or should reveal or what they should or share, should, should not share to their uh, colleagues and to the people that work with them. But I do want you to all think about exactly what kind of credible example and credible signal it sends when a leader says to the people that work under them, hey, look, I've dealt with this too. It's OK. Uh, this is something that we can make better. And this is something that will fit into our organization. So finally, if we reframe this question, how can we observe, uh, how can observing more mental health disorders uh, be a good thing? Well, it can be a good thing because it reflects a unique organizational culture that provides lots of different things, but mostly awareness of the problem and awareness of others. Second of all, the safety to share that information so people know that this is normalized. And finally, and most importantly, the support to get better. Thank you very much.